So hi everybody, today's presentation is called Meet Mitty. And in this talk, we are going to be having Dr. Mindy Goldman, who is Mitty Health's Chief Clinical Officer, who serves as um, UCSF's Director of Gynecology Center for Cancer Survivors and At-Risk Women. And she'll be presenting what women and caretakers need to know about menopause, cancer, and survivorship. Mitty Health is the premier virtual care clinic for women in midlife. Their platform extends your care for women in specialized in women's middle health, middle life health. We, they offer holistic care plans personalized to every patient, including cancer survivors, based on your symptoms and health history. Solutions may include FDA approved hormone therapy, non-hormonal medications, lifestyle coaching, and supplements. So thank you so much, Mitty, for joining us today. And Dr. Goldman, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Okay. So it sounds like you've been introed. I will just go off and I'll just be disc talking. Okay. And I'll have you control the slides, Tori, if you don't uh, mind. Um, I am happy to be here, uh, everyone. Next slide. Um, as was already mentioned, um, basically MIDI is a telehealth platform and we provide insurance covered uh, care for women going through perimenopause and menopause. My specialty and interest is really uh, cancer survivorship and I have helped us uh, developing um, uh, protocols for managing perimenopause and menopause issues for all cancer survivors. Um, I am the chief clinical officer at uh, Midi Health helping design our protocols and um, I am also still part-time at UCSF where I direct the Gynecology Center for Cancer Survivors and At-Risk Women. Um, next. Okay, just to give you a little bit of uh, background, um, before we get into all of the survivorship issues, I just wanna talk a little bit about menopause. So next slide. So um, in general, uh, in non-cancer survivors, the definition of menopause is one year without uh, a period. During that time, we know that the ovaries stop producing both estrogen and progesterone. And um, I'm sure as many of you know, these hormonal shifts can cause a lot of physical as well as emotional symptoms. And how menopause affects each ind individual woman uh, really varies greatly. And the big take home that I do want you to get is that there are many effective treatments available for menopause symptoms from hormone therapy, which some survivors uh, can certainly take uh, to lifestyle changes and many other options that I'm gonna talk about. Next slide. So as I said, the average age is 51, um, but there are people that go into it early. And we see many people at MIDI who have earlier menopause uh, in their 40 to 45 age range. And then less than 40 is premature menopause. And I think in the younger ages, that's where things can really get confusing because people may have some of the menopausal symptoms, but be confused as to why is this going on if the average age of menopause is 51? Next slide. So in um, when someone has cancer, all of this is different because we know that there are cancer treatments that can cause menopausal symptoms. So one thing is people may have their ovaries out as part of their cancer treatment. Sometimes that's done for breast cancer survivors and that can cause the immediate onset of uh, menopause with symptoms. Some of the hormonal medications that are used, uh, oh, if you can go back, <laughs> some of the hormonal medications uh, that are used to treat cancers can cause menopausal symptoms. And we know that uh, chemotherapy isn't, um, unfortunately can affect many other cells in the body. That's why people can lose their hair, but we know uh, it can also affect the ovaries. So chemotherapy can damage the ovaries and people can experience early menopause. And I just want to point out the graph on the right-hand side because you can see with the fluctuations that occur 
around the time of menopause, they sort of mimic what happens to a lot of people when they're going through puberty. And so all of these big hormonal shifts with a lot of symptoms that kind of go along with that. Okay, next slide. Um, so a little bit more about why some cancer treatments can bring on menopause symptoms. And one thing that I always talk about is in my experience, a lot of times for cancer survivors, the symptoms are more intense than in the general population. So why is that? Well, um, if someone has surgical removal of their ovaries and they had completely normal functioning, that is like, boom, it just drops someone into menopause right away. And so sometimes the symptoms are more severe. Um, for women who are on HRT, when they're diagnosed with something like breast cancer, oftentimes they abruptly stop and that can bring on symptoms. We also know that some of the um, anti-estrogen therapies like tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors like letrozole can cause significant side effects like hot flashes for some people. And then, as I mentioned, chemo isn't cell, spe cell specific, nor is radiation, and they can damage and shut down the ovaries, and sometimes uh, that's permanent. So the way that I think about it is certainly at least for breast cancer um, and some of the GYN malignancies with the types of chemo that are used, if women are over 40, chances are they're gonna have permanent uh, menopause. For women under 40 and certainly under 35, almost always, even after chemotherapy, they may get some return of ovarian function. Okay, next slide. So what are the classic symptoms that we see? Um, certainly hot flashes and night sweats are some of the most common. We see a lot of uh, changes in sexual functioning, uh, vaginal dryness, both an effect of menopause. And then for people on drugs like aromatase inhibitors, that's even magnified even more because they shut down all estrogen production in the body. So we can see uh, sexual dysfunction. We see a lot of sleep disturbances. Um, some of that is due to having a lot of temperature dysregulation at night, a lot of night sweats, and other people just have sleep disturbances in general. You can see brain fog and some cognitive changes, difficulty concentrating, some memory lapses. Uh, some people will uh, present to us with uh, mood changes, fatigue, uh, bone loss, weight gain, and many, many others. Next slide. The biggest thing that I try to tell people is there are many safe and effective treatments for cancer survivors and at-risk women. And please don't any let anyone tell you, you just have to suffer through this. Okay, let's explore the different treatment options. So I'm gonna first talk a little bit about lifestyle and wellness therapies. At MIDI, we lean very heavily into this and we think it's really important for uh, overall health. I'll talk a little bit about over-the-counter supplements and botanicals, non-prescription hormonal medications, hormonal medications, and then I'm also gonna talk about vaginal estrogen. Next slide. So in terms of lifestyle supplements and botanicals, certainly we review uh, with people their diet. We know that more of a Mediterranean diet may oftentimes be very helpful and more plant-based can also uh, be very helpful uh, for cancer survivors. We talk to people about exercise. We know specifically for breast cancer survivors that regular interval cardio specific amounts can decrease risk of recurrence and actually improve survival. So all of our providers talk to their patients about uh, what is their exercise regimen, exactly what they're doing, how often. We talk to people about sleep hygiene and we have an entire protocols devoted to giving people specific tips on how to improve their sleep. We talk to people about over-the-counter supplements, both vitamins uh, as well as botanicals. We know that certain botanicals uh, may be uh, safe. Um, black cohosh, for example, um, I chair the menopause survivorship panel for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And we look at research every year and update our guidelines and just looked at research for black cohosh that looks like it's safer than was even thought for breast cancer survivors. 
Um, maca can be helpful for hot flashes as well as improving sexual dysfunction. Ashwagandha can be helpful for um, anxiety and sleep related issues and same with lavender. Next slide. Then there are prescription non-hormonal medications that we will prescribe for uh, both our uh, non-cancer survivors who may choose not to take hormones and certainly for many of our cancer survivors. And these primarily help with a lot of the temperature dysregulation. So a lot of the hot flashes, night sweats, which secondarily help with sleep, which helps with fatigue and oftentimes helps with mood. Um, there are most are off label. There is one that's FDA approved. It's a very low dose of Axel, uh, that's called Brisdil. And then there is off label use of a number of other prescription medicines. So many survivors may know of, uh, gabapentin because it's sometimes used to treat neuropathic pain, but in low doses, it can help out with hot flashes. There are a whole slew of antidepressants that in low doses may help out uh, with hot flashes, much lower than in the doses used for treating mood disorders. There's a blood pressure medicine, clonidine. Medicines that are used to treat overactive bladder, which causes urgency and frequency, have been studied and recommended uh, in low doses also for hot flashes. And then a new drug that just hit the market in May of this year, everyone's very excited. It's called Fezlinitant. Uh, Vizoa is the trade name. And this is an entirely new uh, drug that works in a different part of the brain that controls temperature regulation and also non-hormonal. So none of these things are hormonal and can safely be used for breast cancer survivors or people with other hormone uh, sensitive cancers like um, endometrial cancer and some ovarian. Um, again, take home is lots and lots of options, no reason to suffer. Okay, next slide. Okay, what about HRT? I probably get asked this a lot and all of our providers do. So what is HRT? It is used to treat menopausal symptoms that are brought on by changes in hormone levels. It includes primarily estrogen, which is the component of HRT that makes people feel good. And when someone is taking a HRT, it gets uh, the hormones get into the bloodstream. Um, it can also be used in a way, I'm gonna talk separately about uh, uh, getting directly targeted towards the vaginal tissue. HRT is available in many different forms. It can come in pills. It can come in patches. There are vaginal rings. There's topical creams, gels, many different forms. If women have a uterus, um, you estrogen makes people feel good, but you have to take some form of progesterone to protect the uterine lining from uterine cancer. If women have had a hysterectomy or their uterus removed, they only take estrogen because they don't need uh, progesterone. Now, we know that HRT isn't right for all cancer survivors, but may be appropriate for some. Next slide. And it's important to realize that there's actually no formal national guidelines regarding the use of HRT in women who are at high risk for breast cancer, including those that have a family history, those uh, or uh, genetic mutations, those with a personal history of benign breast disease like atypical ductal or lobular hyperplasia or DCIS, or even for people with a prior history of breast cancer. Um, and at least for people who have a family history or a genetic mutation that puts them at higher risk for getting breast cancer, um, they can safely be offered HRT. So there's no data that says HRT will add on to the risk that someone has based on either having a family history or a genetic mutation. That doesn't mean that people who have those histories don't need to be followed closely. They certainly do. They need high-risk follow-up with clinical breast exams every year, imaging every year, talking to people about lifestyle changes that can decrease the risk of getting cancer, but it doesn't mean that they can't take HRT. And I think sometimes a lot of patients get told that. Next slide. 
What about uh, hormones uh, and cancer survivors? So um, if someone has hormone sensitive breast cancer, so sensitive to either estrogen, progesterone, or both, it is generally considered a contraindication to using HRT. That's where we go to that list where I said we have lots and lots of prescription alternatives. Women who have ERPR negative breast cancer or triple negative can safely take hormones if they have been cancer-free for a period of time. And typically we'll work with someone's oncologist if they're still seeing an oncologist um, and together decide what's the appropriate time where we can then safely offer them HRT. I get asked this a lot, what about with DCIS? If someone has had has DCIS and they've had bilateral mastectomies, the likelihood of getting invasive cancer after that is 1%. And so um, those people we uh, will generally offer HRT to. What about other female cancers, uterine and ovarian? Um, certainly for early stage uh, uterine or endometrial cancer, HRT can be used and there's no data that says it affects recurrence or survival. Most ovarian cancer uh, survivors can use HRT. There are some specific cell subtypes that we won't recommend HRT. And again, we also work with uh, people's oncologists. So together we can make a plan that's appropriate. If someone has uh, another type of cancer that is not sensitive to hormones, HRT certainly may be appropriate and we frequently will offer that. Next slide. Dr. Coleman, can I ask you a question? Of course. About people with um, genetic uh, predispositions, whether it's with a BRCA or a Lynch syndrome. Yep. So that's where I was talking. I put that in together with family history or genetic mutations. So if someone has, for example, BRCA and they have risk reducing removal of their tubes and ovaries and get thrown into menopause, but they still have breast tissue, they haven't had risk reducing mastectomies. There is no data that says those, those uh, people can't take HRT. So even in that very high risk group, there's no data that says HRT and a mutation carrier who still has breast tissue remaining will further increase the risk of getting breast cancer. And in fact, for BRCA carriers who have, uh, or other um, hereditary mutations that uh, increase risk that require oophorectomy, typically we'll recommend giving, as long as there's no evidence of any breast cancer, we typically will recommend starting HRT even in the recovery room. And if they have a uterus, oftentimes we will recommend putting in off-label use of a Mirena IG that, that releases progesterone, high, high levels of progesterone in the lining of the uterus. And that can be placed while someone's under anesthesia so they don't have to have discomfort uh, in the office with placing that. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about vaginal dryness. So we know that with drop in estrogen or with drugs like aromatase inhibitors that even shut down all peripheral estrogen, not just the ovaries, but all estrogen production in every cell in the body, the skin can become drier, both on the outside vulvar tissue uh, and the vaginal tissue and even uh, the bladder. There are estrogen receptors around the bladder. So people will come in with painful sex, vaginal dryness, sometimes tears in the skin on the outside, um, urgency, frequency, sometimes leaking urine. So how do we treat that? First, there are many non-hormonal options and through the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN, um, first line therapy is actually recommended to be over-the-counter things like oils and moisturizers and soothing agents. And if those are used enough, they can definitely help out um, with symptoms. So they can cause relief. They don't change the tissue, but they can definitely help out with symptoms. Hormones or vaginal estrogen specifically changes the tissue. Um, it is thought to improve blood supply, which improves tone, makes the tissue better lubricated, healthier, less uncomfortable. So we use it specifically for dryness, painful intercourse, UTIs. 
when you use vaginal estrogen, it targets the vagina without getting absorption into the bloodstream. And so someone doesn't need to use progesterone to protect the uterine lining. Um, it is safe for nearly all women. It comes in different forms, a suppository, a cream, and a ring. There are certain forms that we do tend to avoid with breast cancer survivors, for example, that have hormone sensitive uh, breast cancer. The creams, when they are used in the usual way, where we tell people to put a bunch of cream in an applicator and push it deep inside in the vagina, um, there are concerns that when you do that, that the surface area in the vagina is greater and a little bit could get absorbed into the bloodstream. So generally the cream formulation in that way is avoided for women with hormone sensitive breast cancers. They can safely use creams along the outside vulva using a pea size amount on the finger rubbed into the area or underneath the urethra where someone pees. And then there have been uh, a number of studies. We did one of the largest ones to date at UCSF looking at the ring form. And there are other groups that have studied the suppository form. And those are thought to be safe even for women who are on drugs like aromatase inhibitors. Next slide. Okay, the biggest thing, as I know, I keep saying it is um, do not feel like you have to suffer if you are a cancer survivor. There are lots and lots of treatment options. It is really important that someone has specialized menopause uh, care because uh, providers need to know and you need to know what is safe and what is not safe. Relief is possible for many of these treatment. Relief of symptoms are, uh, is in days. And at MIDI, we individualize all of our care. We work with survivors to come up with what's the best option for you, for your body that may uh, range from simple lifestyle changes, integrative therapies. It may go to non-hormonal uh, prescription medications. Uh, and for some people, it may be uh, hormonal therapies. Um, and we are dedicated to giving all women, cancer survivors included personalized treatment so that they can feel their best. Um, and I think with that, I will turn it over uh, to questions and feel free to ask anything. And thanks very much.